Thank you for sharing your space and allowing people at the back to find a spot to sit. I'm pleased to report there have not been too many unfavorable comparisons between myself and Kevin in this role. I'm happy about that, but to offset the couple that have been shared, I will offer one of my own at this point. Though my friend Kevin surely has the charm and the sense of humor best suited for this role, I have checked the last seven conferences, and there is certainly no record of him introducing anybody from Italy. Which leads us to our next plenary speaker, Dr. Julie Stamm. Recommended very highly by Dr. Blaine Hajizaki, we were disappointed to learn that Dr. Stamm would be on vacation in Europe and unavailable for the ICS. Dr. Stamm was very interested in joining the presentation team for our summit, and despite being in Italy, has gone to extreme lengths to join us remotely to share her work and her expertise. Dr. Stamm and her husband altered travel plans and they had to limit their accommodation choices for these couple of days to hotels with adequate Wi-Fi to make all of this work. Though she is not able to take part in the full conference experience, because Dr. Stamm embraced this opportunity, understands the importance of this event, and went above and beyond to make it work for all of us, we will all leave better informed on brain trauma in children and youth. We are grateful that you have joined us, Dr. Stamm, and thank you. Now for a little bit about Dr. Julie Stamm. She's a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's the author of the book, The Brain on Youth Sports, The Science, The Myths, and the Future, and she's also a licensed athletic trainer. Dr. Stamm brings a unique perspective on the issues of repeated head impacts in sports. She's a scientist who spent years researching concussions, subconcussive impacts, CTE and the consequences of repetitive brain trauma in youth. Dr. Stamm has acquired great knowledge of childhood development throughout the body and the brain, and she has studied the long-term consequences of repeated head impacts in sports as a doctoral student at Boston University. She has also received training in brain imaging at the Harvard Medical School, Brigham Women's Hospital. As an athletic trainer, she became interested in the topic of sports-related brain trauma in kids when she cared for a high school athlete with post-concussion syndrome, and she published the first scientific paper ever to examine the long-term consequences of repeated hits to the head through youth tackle football. Her work has been published in high-impact, peer-reviewed journals, and covered in mainstream media publications worldwide. Thank you for joining us from Italy, Dr. Stam. We appreciate all you've done to make this work for us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, buongiorno and ciao da Salerno. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you. Uh, this is a vacation that was supposed to start on March 12, 2020. Uh, so we're very excited to finally be in Italy, uh, bigger and better this time around. So, uh, But unfortunately, I can't be there in person. Instead, I'm here virtually to talk about the consequences of repetitive brain trauma in youth sports. Where are we and where do we need to go? So next slide. Just a quick disclosure. The primary disclosure is that I'm the author of The Brain on New Sports and may receive royalties for that. Next slide. So I want to start by highlighting the benefits of youth sports. Anytime that we talk about concussions and repetitive brain trauma and the potential policy implications and changes to youth sports, we need to keep in mind how critically important uh, youth sports are. They have so many benefits for kids, social benefits, emotional benefits, mental health benefits, uh, decreased uh, depressive symptoms, for example, benefits in school, health benefits, of course, from physical activity. Although I will say that uh, with physical activity, if we're just uh, standing in line half of practice, we don't get the same um, benefits, so it's important that they're really raising the heart rate to gain those. And also physically active kids are more likely to be physically active adults, and physically active adults 
are more likely to have physically active children. So it starts a great cycle there too. So we really need to make sure that we are still providing sport opportunities. We're not trying to get rid of any sports. We just want to make these sports safer for our kids. Next slide. So parents are concerned and many people involved in youth sports are concerned. Pediatricians are overwhelmingly reporting that parents are asking about concussions, that they have concerns. An associated press poll from a few years back showed that 44% of parents weren't comfortable with their child playing tackle football. And uh, we know that numbers are down in a lot of sports and there are many causes of that. Potentially sports specialization, for example, cost, uh, but uh, participation is down and that's a big concern. If parents uh, don't allow their children to play sports because of these concerns, especially concerns about repetitive brain trauma, then they're not gaining all of those benefits. So we want kids to play sports. Uh, we just need to figure out the way to minimize that risk. I just want to say a, a short bit specific about concussions in the pediatric population. I'm sure you'll hear much about that throughout this conference and also perhaps you already have from Dr. Cantu. Uh, but we know that compared to adults, children and adolescents are at higher risk of sustaining a concussion. Uh, one study showed that 9 to 14 year old football players, uh, it took a lower level of acceleration in their brain to result in a concussion on average compared to the older players. Uh, and there may be many reasons for that. Uh, myelination is one of those. So uh, myelin is this insulating layer around our axons that connect different parts of our brain. And we lay down layers and layers and layers of myelin to help our signals travel faster when we're young. And that myelin is also protective. So when we have less myelin, there's less protection for our axons. And also a child's head is disproportionately large compared to their body size, uh, compared to an adult. So it creates a bobblehead-like effect uh, that also results in you know, greater whiplash-like movement of the head and greater risk. And I really wanna to emphasize too, that with children, both with repetitive impacts and also with concussions, returning to baseline may not mean full recovery. So if a child has a concussion and they go through a recovery period and they return to where they were prior to that concussion, their peers have gone through learning and development happening over that time. And especially if that time is somewhat prolonged, you know, returning to baseline doesn't mean they are returning to the level of their peers. So uh, we really need to work on getting these kids back to not only baseline, but the level that their peers are at. Uh, and that really means being conservative as well. Next slide. I also want to talk about repetitive subconcussive impacts. That's really where I'm going to focus uh, the research that I talk about here. These are the impacts that don't result in concussive symptoms. It's not a great name because we don't really know what subconcussive is. One hit that has a very high acceleration may cause uh, a concussion and one hit with a lower acceleration may not. So uh, we don't really know what that means, but we generally have been using this term subconcussive for impacts that do not result in concussion symptoms. These include collisions at the line in football, uh, tackles in rugby, or hiding a soccer ball, for example. Next slide. So when I first started uh, giving talks like this, I had a slide with a few studies up here about the effects of subconcussive trauma on the brain. But now if you advance it, uh, you'll see that there are study after study just piling on about um, the consequences of repetitive impacts on the brain. So it seems pretty clear at this point that something happens when we're hitting our head repeatedly. We've seen studies uh, looking at chemical levels in the brain, looking at the white matter pathways in the brain, connecting different parts of the brain, studies using functional MRI, many imaging studies showing differences even from the start of a season to the end of the season in athletes who did not sustain a concussion. 
if you advance the slide one more time, you'll see uh, two studies should be highlighted there. And uh, these two studies are specific to kids. Many of these studies have been done in high school and college athletes, but um, these are two examples of studies that were done in youth football players looking at the consequences of one season of play. And one showed that there were changes in the white matter pathways connecting different parts of the brain over one short season of youth football. And another study also saw differences in connectivity on functional MRI. And keep in mind that typically a youth football season is about 30 total practices and games. And a high school season tends to be about 60 or so, right around there. So uh, these are even shorter youth football seasons. So next slide. I often hear, um, particularly from parents, uh, the argument that, oh, they're just kids. They don't hit their head that much. And it's not entirely accurate. So youth football players in some studies have been shown to uh, sustain at least 200 to 300 impacts per season in that 9 to 12 range. Uh, other studies have shown in the 7 to 8 range about 150 to 200 impacts. Um, and it, it varies, of course, by position, by the number of practices and games they uh, attend. But these tend to be the averages. And in some studies, those averages or the, the highest number of impacts sustained have gone from you know, 585, even up to 800 impacts in a short youth season. Now, college and high school average impacts tend to be a little bit higher. The studies range from about 300 to 800 and vary by position and a number of other factors. Uh, but keeping in mind that high school and college seasons are longer, when you look at the number of impacts per event, we actually see that they're not that far off uh, between the younger players and the older players. And we even see that the accelerations are slightly lower with the youth players, but not necessarily. They can sustain very high um, acceleration impacts and they can sustain impacts on average that are really very close to the high school and college counterparts. Next slide. So I wanna talk for a minute about brain development. Because if we wanna understand the consequences of repeatedly hitting your head during a critical time in brain development, we need to understand how the brain develops. Brain development goes through peaks and plateaus, and every structure in the brain has a different peak and a different plateau, and they tend to have multiple peaks and multiple plateaus. So it's really important when we design these studies that we need to look at the specific structure that we're studying, and even the specific function that we're studying and design it based on those peaks and plateaus. You can see in the image on the right, these are different white matter pathways in the brain connecting different parts of the brain. Some have a very quick development. They reach their peak around age 12. Some continue to develop into our 30s. There are many, many uh, developmental uh, things happening in that eight to 12 range, when a lot of students, student athletes are starting to play sports. Uh, we see peaks in myelination laying down that insulation layer. We see peaks in blood flow to support that. We see peaks in the size of certain structures in the brain uh, and many other processes happening in that eight to 12 range. Next slide. Now critical periods, are these times when the brain is developing really, really rapidly. And these can be windows of opportunity. So a window of opportunity would be, for example, uh, starting the onset of ballet dancing or musical training has been shown to physically alter the brain and how the brain develops for the better for those tasks. Now, I want to say uh, with this that it does not mean a specific movement or a specific, hitting a specific note with music, for example. So we're not comparing this to making a tackle or checking or throwing a pass. It's about motor control, for example, uh, that we're developing by starting these things younger. 
it's not a specific task. So this is not promoting sports specialization by any means, but just being uh, athletic, for example, will help us with motor control and being more athletic. Uh, but these critical periods of brain development can also be windows of vulnerability. One study looked at exposure to physical and sexual abuse, and when that abuse happened in the 9 to 12 range age range, excuse me, 9 to 10 age range, it specifically affected the corpus callosum more. And this is a structure that is connecting the right and left sides of the brain. When this, that abuse happened between ages 11 and 13, the hippocampus was more affected. And the hippocampus is a structure involved in memory. And during that 9 to 10 range, corpus callosum is going through a lot of myelination. It's a very important time for that development. And during the 11 to 13 range, that's a peak time for the hippocampus. So if you advance the slide once, I should say that when the trauma happens matters. It's important. And that goes for, I believe, repetitive trauma potentially or any kind of environmental factor on the brain that the timing matters. A structure going through peak development will be more likely to be affected. Next slide. I want to take one more moment to just talk a little bit about the body as a whole. So I'm an anatomist in my other professional life. Uh, I study the body as a whole, and I want to give you a couple of other examples. So if a child has a fracture that affects their growth plate, that can cause the growth plate to prematurely close and then not grow anymore the way it should. And that limb could potentially be shorter than it's intended to be. But if a fracture happened in a child in the middle of the bone, away from the growth plate, the cells that go or that uh, lay down new bone can go into overdrive and actually make that limb longer because they build too much bone. Neither of those outcomes would happen with a fracture in an adult. That's specific to a growing child. Our alveoli in our lungs, where gas is exchanged, oxygen and carbon dioxide, we are continually making alveoli even into our late teens and early 20s. And smoking in our teenage years or even younger can disrupt that process, potentially leading to a lower number of alveoli that we have which might not affect us throughout life, but if we have uh, a disease or aging um, that eventually breaks down some of the alveoli, we may see consequences from that. Lead poisoning affects the body all over the body, and it has particularly bad consequences for children. It can affect adults too, but it's far worse for children, and that's effects on the body as a whole and effects on the brain, it's pretty substantial effects on the brain. And I say this here because it, there's sometimes resistance to the thought that repetitively hitting our head could cause any uh, difficulties if we don't have symptoms from that. But the body as a whole tells us that we can disrupt that development, that some environmental factors can disrupt development, whether that's bones or lungs or many other places. Lead poisoning affects the body, it affects the brain. Emotional trauma at specific times in development affects the brain. If repetitive brain trauma didn't cause some sort of effect on the brain, that repetitive jostling, it would be an anomaly. It would be unlike pretty much everywhere else in the body. Now, sometimes there are anomalies in the body, right? The liver can regenerate, uh, but that's rare. So it seems that there's probably something happening. And if you go to the next slide, the question is, what are those consequences of repetitive brain trauma? How bad are they? Are they bad enough that we should be concerned? Um, what are the consequences specifically? Are they worse for some people than others? So there are many, many questions that this leads to. This was something I was very interested in looking into for my dissertation work at the Boston University CTE Center. Um, and that's something I'm gonna talk about several of the studies uh, that we did, hopefully, um, it's not repeat. I know Dr. Cantu also worked on these studies, um, but hopefully this will be new for you. So next slide. So the first study that we did looking at these later life outcomes, 
And AFE on this means age of first exposure to tackle football in particular. Uh, we looked at former NFL players ages 40 to 65, and we looked back at when they started playing football and divided them into two groups. We used age 12 as a cutoff in these studies because what we were looking at made sense based on the functions we were looking at and based on all of those things that I showed you earlier that are happening in that eight to 12 range. We found that those who started playing tackle football before age 12 performed significantly worse on measures of executive functions, memory and learning, and uh, estimated verbal IQ. So executive functioning is those things like planning, decision-making, multitasking, judgment, things like that. And I just want to note the estimated verbal IQ measure was not by any means comprehensive, but it's something that we can look into in future studies. Next slide. We did another study with a group of high school, college, and professional football players, and none of the professional players overlapped the previous study. And we found, uh, again, using the age 12 cutoff, that those who began playing before age 12 had about double the odds of reporting difficulty with depression, apathy, and uh, executive functions. Again, that judgment, decision-making, multitasking, things like that. And they were also two to three times more likely to have clinically meaningful depression and apathy. So something that might be concerning to a doctor. I also want to note that in this study, we had slightly fewer players who only played through high school, uh, but it was still around 25%. And the other groups were pretty uh, evenly dispersed. And there was no interaction by level of play. So it didn't matter if they only played through high school or if they played all the way through the pros, these findings still held. They still had the same difficulties. Next slide. So we also wanted to look at the brain structure. And we started with that corpus callosum structure that is connecting the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And we looked at 40 former NFL players and found that the three regions towards the front of the brain or on the left uh, of your screen, those three regions demonstrated a lack of integrity. So one of the measures we looked at uh, that we call FA, uh, it was uh, different in those who started playing younger. It was lower in those who started playing younger. And that's a, a measure of the lack of integrity of that pathway. There's also one measure that we call radial diffusivity, uh, and that's in the upper right of the uh, charts that you see there. This is a measure that is thought to be reflective of the amount of myelin that you have on your axons, so that insulating coating. And having a higher radial diffusivity is thought to mean that there's less myelin. Uh, and that's what we found in those who were, uh, who had started playing before age 12. And it could be, although we cannot say this by any means, um, but it's possible that those repetitive impacts may have disrupted that myelination process. And that's why in those who started at a younger age, we're seeing more space between axons and essentially less less myelin. Uh, this is something that definitely needs to be studied much further, uh, but it was a very interesting finding um, that might have suggested that the myelination process could have been disrupted. Next slide. We did two other studies of uh, brain structure as well. We looked at a structure called the thalamus, and the thalamus is a structure that's a major relay station in the brain. And we saw that those who started playing tackle football at a younger age had a smaller thalamus, particularly on the right side. Uh, and we did not use age 12 as a cutoff here. And going back to what I said about brain development, it's so important to make sure that these studies are designed based on brain development. So uh, this structure doesn't reach a peak really until about age 15 or so. So using an age 12 cutoff didn't make sense. So we just used a continuous variable here and saw the younger they were when they started playing, the smaller on average their thalamus size was. Also, we looked at the cortex of the brain and the 
cortex is that outer layer of the brain that has our cell bodies. It's kind of that like, thinking portion of the brain that's doing all the processing. And we saw that the cortex in several areas was thinner in those who started playing at a younger age. Next slide. So we found differences in our studies, but not everybody has. We want to be very transparent about that. Uh, there are several studies that have looked at specifically former football players and have not seen differences on neuroimaging, uh, neurological, psychiatric, or neuropsychological tests as well. Um, one of these in particular uh, with former NFL players really didn't take into account neurodevelopment. So uh, that's one thing that I wish they would have more. Um, so important to look at the structures you're, you're studying and design it specifically based on the development of those uh, structures. Uh, then other studies from the CARE Consortium, which is a giant study of uh, NCAA uh, institutions and uh, athletes in many sports, several studies there did not see differences based on the age the indiv individual started playing in current high school or college athletes. And uh, I think that's really interesting. There was one other study as well uh, that did not see differences in specifically just high school athletes. Uh, and then there was uh, another study as well in current rugby players who are community-based rugby players uh, that are early adult life age, and they didn't see differences there. And I'm gonna come back to this concept of why we at least found differences in older adults, but the current players, the younger uh, individuals, we didn't, or we're not seeing differences in, from other groups. Uh, I also want to mention there was a study on boxers that found that the earlier that an individual started boxing, the smaller the size of their hippocampus and corpus callosum, so memory and that connection between uh, the two sides of the brain. And they also saw differences on Neuros neuropsychological testing and depression. And I just want to say, though, that it wasn't specified in that study how old they were when they had started uh, their boxing, but it varies from nation to nation, but competitive, at least to some degree of um, sparring, can start uh, as young as age eight or in some cases even younger, although it's regulated, um, it still can start young. So we don't know exactly what the age was in this study. Next slide. One question I get often is, well, can tackling increase, or yet at a young age, increase the risk of getting CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy? And next slide. And the answer seems to be no. So just hitting your head repeatedly as a kid alone does not seem to increase the risk for getting CTE, which is good, that's great. We'll say that having a greater number of overall lifetime impacts does seem to make a difference, but simply hitting your head uh, just at a young age doesn't seem to influence getting CTE. Uh, but a study done at the CTE Center in Boston did find that those who started tackling before age 12 uh, had an onset, and they went, excuse me, those who went on to get CTE anyway, and uh, started tackling before age 12, had about 13 years earlier onset of symptoms. And for every one year younger they were when they started tackling, that symptom onset was two and a half years earlier. So why would this be? Next slide. So I want to use a little analogy here. Imagine that we have two cars driving down the road. They are the same model, same make, going the same speed. They burn gas at the same rate but one has a full tank of gas to start with, and one has three quarters of a tank. Both of these cars can go down the road for really long ways, and we will know no difference between the two. But one will run out of gas first. You can advance the slide. Uh, so one will run out of gas first, obviously the one that starts with, with less. If you advance the slide one more time, should say that now let's ima imagine that the uh, empty tank signifies the onset of symptoms. So if we're starting with less, we can afford to lose less before the symptoms begin. And it, it's possible, though we need far, far more research to say this, 
but it's possible that development is this time when we are filling our neuronal gas tank in our brain and creating my laying down myelin, creating all these connections in our brain. And if we do something that disrupts that, where we're not quite building up as much as we had, that it's possible we may end up uh, going through life pretty normally, but then, you know, as we lose more and more neurons and connections, then we're going to run out of gas sooner and have an earlier onset of symptoms. So that's something that we definitely need to study more. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So just to tie all of that together, we don't see a risk of CTE just from playing when we're young and hitting our head when we're young, aside from increased potential impacts of our lifetime. And we uh, haven't seen differences in those who are younger. We haven't seen an effect at the age they started in those who are younger. But at least in some of some studies, we have seen that effect when they're older. And uh, it may be potentially from decreasing that neural gas in the tank. And this is interesting because to try to make policy changes related to this, you know, we're terrible as humans at um, changing our behavior based on something that might be a consequence in, you know, a week or two. But, of course, this would be potentially decades down the road. Next slide. So we have so much more research to do on this. We have only just scratched the surface of this topic. Ideally, we would do a study where we have children who are younger uh, before they start, you know, in their sport, we study them then. Some will play contact sports, some will play other sports, some will uh, not play sports, and we follow them for decades. And this study should absolutely be done. But what do we do now with the very limited information that we do have? So next slide. So what does this mean for the future of contact sports and how can we improve uh, the safety for the brain in, in youth sports? Next slide. So one of the big things we need to do is improve education. Knowledge does not mean a change in attitudes and behaviors. So just giving an info sheet and saying this is what a concussion is and what you should do doesn't mean that is going to change reporting behaviors. That education needs to be engaging and effective and it needs to go throughout the season. It shouldn't be just one presentation at the start and then, you know, that's it especially for younger athletes. They're going to remember it more if it's brought up multiple times, maybe even sprinkled into practice here and there, uh, maybe even a role playing or a case scenario in practice. But the more it can be brought up and, and encourage that reporting, the more likely it is that an athlete will report and that they'll remember that education. We also need to enforce concussion laws. You know, I know a big driver behind, you know, all of you being here today is the, the Rowan's Law in uh, in Canada, and we have laws in every state uh, in the United States, at least in some form of a law that covers concussions and what should be done, education, things like that. But they need to be enforced. Um, we did a study at the University of Wisconsin where we looked at high school coaches compared to club sport coaches, and we found that high school coaches had uh, better concussion knowledge and we're more likely to have received education and know if they have a concussion management plan as well. And these are in states where it, the law specifically covers both the scholastic programs as well as club programs, non-school affiliated programs. Some states, the law only covers school programs, but in the states in our study, it covered both. Yet club sport coaches still weren't getting that, even though they were supposed to abide by the law. So we really need to make sure we're enforcing those laws. We also need to change the culture. That's a big piece. Um, and that's a, a terribly hard thing to do. We need to emphasize athleticism over big hits and really encourage health and reporting. And a lot of that starts with the coaches and parents. Um, coaches who encourage reporting can really make a big dent in this unreporting issue or underreporting issue that we have. Um, athletes have in studies uh, said that they are far more likely to report if they have a coach that they think supports it. 
So, and and that's not just implied. You have to state it directly. Actually tell them that you support it and show that you support it as well. And then the other piece is protecting the young brain by just not hitting it over and over again. And um, hockey in both the United States and Canada has uh, delayed the introduction of checking uh, until the age of 13 and in some areas until 15. USA Soccer has delayed the introduction of heading until age 11 and limited that until age 13. Uh, and that's happening also in other countries around the world. Um, football has made some changes, but it's they're still hitting their head. Um, maybe it's less, maybe it's better. Um, some studies have been supportive some of that. Some studies have been mixed, but they're still hitting their head. And if we can really delay that, we can encourage that brain development and let that go for a longer amount of time and then minimize the repetitive impacts at the higher levels by really, we don't need to hit in practice. Many successful programs in uh, football in particular have not had uh, contact to the ground in, in practices and done really, really well. Uh, the kids still learn through uh, methods of not taking their opponent to the ground or their teammate to the ground, and they do really well. So if we can minimize those impacts when we're older, eliminate them when we're younger, we're decreasing our total lifetime impacts, and we are um, promoting that brain development as well by giving some time before those impacts start. We are never going to prevent every concussion. Accidents will happen. You know, we're not wrapping kids in bubble wrap. That's not, not what we're asking for. But we can you know, really uh, minimize those impacts that happen and not have them be an inherent part of the game, at least when they're younger. And you know, sometimes there's pushback to that. If you go to the next slide, I just want to address a few myths and misconceptions. Um, one of them being that kids don't want to play if they can't tackle, for example. But hockey has shown that that's not true. The kids still love to play hockey, even though they're not checking uh, at a younger age. And you know, they, didn't, they reported in one study that they didn't feel like they needed to check to enjoy it. They're just out there with their friends having a good time. Um, some people say that it will ruin the game, but people said it would ruin the game of football in particular when um, the forward pass was introduced. And can you even imagine football without a forward pass nowadays, <laughs> without a quarterback? Like that would be crazy, right? Um, so, you know, it's just a change that we'd have to endure. And another one I want to point out is um, some people have been concerned that delaying the start of contact, whether that's hockey or even heading in soccer, <clears throat> tackling in football or rugby, for example, uh, most of the studies have been in football, so that's been uh, addressed more. But uh, some people have been concerned that delaying that contact would increase the risk of injury when they do have contact introduced. And thus far, there's zero evidence to support that. Uh, and the evidence from hockey actually shows the opposite, that there's no increased risk uh, of injury from starting later. So if you go to the next slide, just wanna leave you with this again, that sports have so many benefits. Every kid should have the opportunity to play sports and to gain the many, many wonderful benefits of sports. Uh, but they should be able to do that without hitting their head repeatedly. And they can do that without hitting their head repeatedly um, and having that you know, risk for long-term consequences. So with that, if you want to advance through the next couple of slides that are references and end on the questions uh, slide, um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Realize we're up against lunch, but having been fluid with our uh, schedule all day long, we do have time for a couple of questions. Certainly, it has been set up by our AV guys that if um, you go to the microphone, just as you have with our other live presenters in person, that uh, Dr. Stan will be able to hear your your question as well. So, if there are a couple questions or a question or two, uh, please make your way to the microphone. Two things, Dr. Stam, really, really clear, and you're in the dreaded spot up against lunch. <laughs> yes, I understand. We truly appreciate you uh, stealing time from your holiday to make such a valuable contribution to the International Concussion Summit. Um, 
we know, and I mentioned earlier, the great lengths that you went to and, and the time you spent in this, and it's truly appreciated. Um, enjoy the remainder of your holiday. Uh, we will connect soon, and thank you again very much. Thank you so much for having me. I know that we are in the world of uh, virtual learning, but that was still uh, pretty cool to have someone here from, from Italy today. And I, with that goes great thanks to the, the team in the back. Thank you and to Roy Smith to help uh, facilitate that. Also to our communications team at the DSPN, uh, just as a backup, we had, we had Dr. Stam uh, connect with us before she went on holidays from her office in, at University of Wisconsin, just so we had a backup of, of this. Didn't need to use it, thankfully, uh, but certainly a commitment by our communications team to make that work for us today as well. It is lunchtime. Uh, please make your way to Braza. It can be found on this floor just that way. As I said earlier, just follow the crowd. Please remember to take your badges with you. And if you could come back to the ballroom just a little before 1.15 for the afternoon. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.